Please be seated. still to come up and give that. It's quite a clear name of the poster, isn't it? Yeah. He's actually not in. <laughs> Is he? Oh yeah, he's there. Yeah. I think James is asking whether he should do the uh, as part of the report, whether he should do the youth part of it and move the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So at the moment it's discussion. Okay, gentlemen, the situation uh, is at the moment that uh, uh, the chairman of the board has uh, moved uh, the report uh, for the missions board with the exception of the youth section of that report, which will be dealt with separately. And the amendment that is related to the youth section will also be dealt with at that point. Uh, so uh, at, at this point in proceedings, you have an opportunity to speak to the report uh, or to any of the amendments. And I would invite anyone that would like to speak at this point to the report or to the amendments uh, to do so. Is anyone, can anyone remember <laughs> what was uh, said before lunch? I hope you all went out for a quick jog and some fresh air and are ready to respond to the mission report. So, who would like to speak to uh, the report or to the amendments? Mr. Miller. Uh, and I have a, owe him a great debt, your, your father, your mother, you as a family, and it's deli a delight to see you there. God bless and keep you as you serve this way. There are many things in the, the report that I would like to be able to talk about. Um, those of you who know something of my story would understand when I uh, think of the, uh, the foreign work I'm delighted to uh, read the report of the progress that's been made in South Africa in both the uh, Dumasani Institute and in the Free Church in Southern Africa. And the, uh, the, I, I had a sense of it myself a few years ago when I was able to go and visit. Um, so it's, it is very encouraging to see the progress that's been made, especially towards a more independent, uh, indigenous um, uh, character, if you like, of both of these institutions. Um, but in particular, I want to speak more about the ecumenical side of things for just a moment. Um, the, well, perhaps two parts of it. One is to pick up on an item in the report in, on page 32 uh, on the developing ecumenical relations, and I uh, endorse what the uh, mission director, David Meredith, spoke about earlier and the changing character and the importance of looking for a meaningful uh, ecumenic relations. But perhaps just to um, give a little bit of light on the, 
uh, ICRC and the European version of it, because I would like to think, I think there are growing signs that um, something is being done about being more meaningful. Uh, I, we're not the only church that has had this question, and we've got Canadian brothers uh, with us, and I think many of the churches have said, well, how can we make this more, more meaningful, more effective? Uh, I think for a while uh, you start up a conference and you come up with ideas for talks and things, um, but it starts to become just a routine. But more recently there have been efforts being made to uh, make a bit more progress with, uh, it's, it's all about, these and the World Reform Fellowship too are all about um, uh, encouraging and facilitating and um, promoting uh, cooperation between churches so that uh, we, as the Free Church in Scotland, have uh, partners in England, in the uh, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, in Ireland, in Canada, and so on. It's, it's with that kind of thing in mind. Um, but there, there has been recognition that there might be more things can be done. Uh, for example, in, on the mission side of things, there have been efforts made to draw together information where the different churches are serving across the world so that those red dots that we had on the map there, if you took all the churches, member churches in mind, uh, it would spread uh, far more widely. But it's to link, link up and to uh, enable people to, to make use of that. And theological education is another one, a recognition that, that how vitally important that is and that there might be support one towards the other. And perhaps, in a way, the European version meets more often and has made a bit more progress down that line. Um, it's still work to be done, and it's what we do with it. It's the, the information can be gathered, but it's what we choose to do with it uh, when we have it. And do we uh, link up with a church that might be serving somewhere if one of your congregation comes and says, I, I believe God's calling me to, to work in Kenya, for example? Do we have a church that's working there that we already immediately have openings with? So that, that kind of work is, there is a, a growing awareness of that, and so there, there is perhaps more potential, but it's, again, it is what you do with it. And um, I think one little item that I would like to offer to you is that in the, the European conference, there has been discussion lately to see if it would be possible to um, in some, at some level or other to organize a, a youth conference in Europe of some of our leaders. I was thinking, for example, of the young folk that go to the boot camp, that you're developing leaders there, that amongst our leaders, other churches amongst their leaders, uh, construct a, a, a youth conference. So we invite uh, leading uh, youth from other churches to, to come together here. Something along those lines has been uh, mooted recently. Um, but one of the, the, the reason I want to talk about this especially is that um, it, it's not just about what we might get from them, but what me, we might give, uh, what can we give to them as well. And we've heard mention a couple of times of places like Sudan, and uh, several uh, of, of you uh, go from time to time, places like Kenya and so on, and what we might be able to give uh, through these networks as well. And that comes to uh, an item that uh, I think, where is it, on page 34 regarding the Dutch Reformed Church, and uh, in shorthand we call it the, the Freikemacht. And I know our Canadian brothers have a particular interest in this matter as well. Um, the, they're, they're in the process of a synod this year, and uh, one of the questions that they have, in, in fact three big questions they're dealing with, one, they're looking at a merger of theological institutions, which uh, immediately is a, a, a key area in church life. Um, another that was, uh, I was invited to, uh, to represent you was a session dealing with uh, male and female in office in the church. They'd already dealt with or had material on male and, ch and female in church, but male and female in office and um, a number of, quite a number of churches were gathered from around the world through this, uh, this network of sister churches and asked to make a contribution uh, to their debate. It was quite limited, the time that was available, uh, but they asked for our views, what we do, our, our, our practice and our, our understanding, our principles. Um, and of all the churches that were visiting, 
uh, every one of them, bar one, uh, was, uh, spoke very, very plainly that our, our belief and our practice is uh, in the, sorry, the, the deliverance a bit further down, page 45. Our terms are General Assembly send greetings to the Reformed Churches Liberated of the Netherlands. They, they urge them to remain faithful to the biblical teaching regarding sexuality and complementarianism as they discuss these issues in their church courts. And every church that was represented visiting uh, said that their practice is uh, men only in office. Uh, an interesting point was raised by one of our Irish brothers that it doesn't mean all men are suitable for office. That needs to be recognized as well. But that apart, um, that there, but there is a, a complementarian uh, way of reflecting on these things. Um, so we spoke to them about our, our belief, our practice, and um, urged them that they should hesitate because very clearly the mind uh, on the ground was that they should begin to allow women in the offices of the church. Uh, the only one that wasn't um, of that mind at the moment, uh, but was going through the same process, and so bear them in mind, was our, our friends in South Africa, and Thomas Dreyer is here, and let's remember them in prayer in the same regard. Um, so we made it plain. I think one of the things that came out of the discussion was expressed by many of the Western churches that were visiting, that we need to realize and wake up to our limitations in how women have a, a place in our churches. Most striking to me was that the particularly Korean and several African churches, they were, many people would look at them and say their, their approach is cultural. That's what the culture does. But they were coming from the same perspective, that the same stance that we have, but they were further down the road than we often are in making good use of their women in an organized, even a formal way not calling them uh, deacons, not calling them elders, certainly not serving in ministry, uh, pulpit ministry and so on, but they were, they were well down the road in making really good use of their women in their churches. And that was something that many of the Western churches uh, recognized as going through these discussions. So it may be one of those things where it's not just what we, uh, how we uh, respond to others, but how, what we learn uh, from them and benefit from them as well. But it's just to pass on, there is a church that for many years was um, more conservative than Neil Macmillan, uh, and uh, now going very far in, in the other direction very quickly. They've been dealing with this for 24 years. Our South African brothers I learned about 30 years. Um, uh, certainly our mind is, why now? Uh, even though if it is the culture that's, that's dealing with it, but the cultural uh, feedback that we had from Asia and Africa uh, can, t can say other things to us as well. Uh, so it's, that's something just to feed back. Um, I was asked to, to attend uh, for you, and uh, if I might offer uh, in haste these uh, few remarks about it. Can I add one, one more thing? I said earlier that when I came from Australia, so I'm, I'm very pleased in the progress that's been made in the relations discussions in Australia uh, with the Presbyterian Church. There's a lot of solid things there. It's not uh, an equal uh, picture across the whole country, uh, but it's, I am encouraged, uh, an equal uh, picture across the whole country, uh, but it's, I am encouraged by that, but at the same time, it's holding on to and supporting the smaller uh, historic link that we're seeing here, but I encourage that. And finally, uh, on account of what I've just taught, the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, the, I think that's a, a, a real encouragement to us as well to take up the, um, the aspect about uh, um, relations with other churches and definitions and so on that come a bit later on in the appendix, that that, that is well worth uh, pursuing, uh, that we should support that, that effort. So thank you, moderator, and fathers and brethren. Would anyone else like to speak to board report or to the amendments? Mr. Morrison, feel free to use either if it's easier to. 
I would just like to draw your attention to something that some of us feel is a glaring omission from the proposed deliverance uh, under the general. It's on page 38. Our uh, chairman has already made reference to the, the sterling work done by the uh, board officers, the mission director, the mission development officer, and the mission coordinator. But can you imagine trying to coordinate the mission director and the uh, outgoing chairman of the board who couldn't even get her name right this morning? And I think we, uh, as a General Assembly, it's too late to put it in print, but uh, I think we should take this opportunity of thanking the mission coordinator, Sarah, who's sitting over there and is probably never going to speak to me again. But uh, Sarah does a phenomenal amount of work. She does indeed coordinate all the, the board meetings with agendas and minutes and briefing papers. We've heard about the strategy days that have been organised and uh, Sarah does a lot, to, does everything to, to bring these things together. We've also heard reference to uh, sometimes the, the, the difficult decisions that are taken and uh, it's perhaps poor Sarah that has to communicate these decisions to people and uh, she certainly doesn't complain to the board about any flack that she gets but it's not always an, an easy uh, task for, for her to uh, carry out the responsibilities and the duties that the board place upon her. So uh, I would just like to take this opportunity of inviting you to thank our mission coordinator for her hard work. Mr. Meredith. Uh, I can't speak because I, I'm a member in a second. As a point of order, can you just clarify uh, for the House that the strategy document is in fact open for discussion and comment as part of this debate? There's some ambiguity about that. Yeah, I'm the mother. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I would regard it as uh, being an act of folly not to allow discussion. Uh, about this strategy document, which is part of uh, the whole uh, report that has been presented today. So, yes, uh, when I was looking for comment uh, and response on the uh, mission report, I, I, in my own thinking, was including the strategy document as part of that. Uh, I should have stated that. Thank you. So, does anyone have anything to add and uh, uh, Comment on with regard to the strategy document or Kenneth, Mr. Boyd. Well, first of all, moderator, congratulations on your appointment. And uh, you will, however, understand that in some places there is perhaps disbelief, perhaps dismay that that Derek Lamont is moderator of the Free Church of Scotland. <coughs> she, she might be watching. Uh, anyway, uh, just in relation to the, the strategy document, uh, to be honest, I haven't read it right through. It's quite lengthy. It's really only a few days since the opportunity to start looking at it. But I think some of the points that Re Neil raises in his amendment uh, are worthy of consideration. Uh, at the moment, many of you will be aware, you're probably in the middle of it, working on a congregational development plan, which is something all congregations are, say, encouraged, but perhaps are required to do. And these development plans should be feeding into your presbytery, which will also be working on a strategy uh, and yet, at the Assembly today, we're being asked to approve a, a, a pretty large strategy document from the Missions Board, which, yes, certainly should be setting the tone for the denomination as a whole, setting the tone for presbyteries, setting the tone for congregations. And, and yet, in many parts of our denomination, local congregations are really only just beginning to grapple with what is strategy what is a development plan? Uh, and I think, there's, I don't know whether this is policy or not, but I, I think the better way of developing the overall strategy is to allow the ideas, 
and the plans to come from the grassroots about to, to pitch into the fray when David was saying there's no one going to speak on the strategy document. Um, I agree with quite a few of the comments that uh, Neil was making earlier and that it, it seems to me as well to be unfinished uh, and I would look at this having dealt over the years with quite a few strategy documents as a draft strategy for consultation uh, and you know, one of the things that jumps out to me uh, is looking at it and saying suggested action points. I think when we have a, a finalised strategy, you want them to be firm action points for people to deal with. Uh, and under each of the, the different sections, uh, it's got a number of uh, action points to be done by congregations. Uh, and yet, there, to date, no congregation has actually seen this document. And I dare say, down at member level, most are probably unaware uh, that this strategy development work is actually happening. And uh, I think we really would benefit from this document going right down to Kirk Sessions for Kirk, Kirk Sessions to actually speak with the congregations themselves. Um, I can think back to when I um, worked in the mission field quite a long time ago now in West Africa. And uh, I was attached, I worked for Tier, tier Fund, but was attached to WEC Mission out in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, one of their missionaries came from another country and he was stressing at that point a key thing about having a strategy for the evangelism of the country. And I and a number of other people naturally were very resistant to the thought of this idea being raised. Because when we talk about a gospel of grace, your, your first thought is it's about what God does, not about what we do. And uh, over the years I've realized in my own mind that that was the wrong attitude to have then. Uh, and it is uh, beholden on us to have proper plans that are well thought through to maximize the use of the resources that we have for the extension of the kingdom. And therefore, strategy documents are incredibly useful. But I suspect if those goes down to many local congregations, we'll have very similar reactions from many uh, individuals at first thought. And, to, and therefore, to have the opportunity to think through, okay, what are we going to do as a congregation rather than just same old, same old? What are our plans going to be to reach out to the local community? I think it uh, would be really useful. And, and you'd have two benefits from that as you would strengthen uh, what this document would say at the end of the process because you'd start to engage the congregations and get, get a lot more information in. But it would play that key role, I think, in facilitating congregations actually having the discussion uh, which many are not having at the moment uh, and I think there could be real uh, advantage in that. So I would ask uh, commissioners just to, to think on that one. Um, a second thing that I'll pick up on is just looking uh, at the table on uh, the mission board expenditure and I for one am always very supportive uh, of looking to put more funds into mission and I think very much what is being proposed uh, uh, in terms of trying to maximize resources and, and just pointing out the benefits of increased giving. Uh, but I think in the financial appendix, uh, the figures that are given there are not particularly helpful. Um, it gives the example uh, of what could be done if there was a 12% increase in income showing that on projected income figures on page 30 at the moment, uh, the board will actually have a deficit. And then on page 31, if you have a 12% increase in income, uh, you'll end up with uh, a significant surplus each year. Um, to my mind, it would be extremely helpful if the projection was about what do we need uh, for the needs of the board to be met. 
uh, and for it to be detailed. This is what we really are expecting or would want to spend our money on, and therefore we need X. Um, I imagine if the giving went up by 12% and there was a £277,000 surplus, um, the Mission Board would very soon be able to find areas where that money could be spent on. And it could be very helpful, in effect, to identify a number of projects and challenge the church. Well, if the giving is at this level, this is what we can do. If we have an extra £100,000, we can do another two or three church plants or we can send uh, someone to do a particular ministry. Uh, those things would be extremely helpful indeed. And um, just picking up from the actual report itself, uh, I notice on, uh, on page 24 the description of the mission director's post. And um, one of the tasks uh, that's down there is to maintain and develop links with other Christian churches and agencies. Uh, the one thing that's actually missing, missing from the mission director's job description is that development of links or, uh, and um, essentially spreading the word to free church congregations. Uh, we had uh, an excellent meeting when David came over and spoke to us about the overseas mission uh, work of the church that people really, really appreciated. And I noticed in David's report, he's got down there that he does that kind of work in other congregations as well. But I think it's very important that should be in his uh, job description. So I would encourage the board to consider amending that in due course. Mr. Patterson. I've just got a quick question, seeing as we're on the, the document. Um, being a minister in the Highlands, we see lots of churches are small and fragile. And I sometimes worry if our ethos is, if you don't have enough money, you're not a healthy congregation. And I almost feel when I'm reading through some of the revitalization action points that the blame for being a small congregation lies within the minister or the people. I believe one man sows what another man reaps, but God gives the increase, but he gives the increase in his time. And harvesting doesn't come overnight. We are reaping the seeds that Professor McIntosh sowed many years ago today. And I wonder if the emphasis on the document is if we do not see results quick enough, i.e. your financial givings, are not good enough within the time, are we allowing for the fact that actually we still need to minister to small groups of people? Because our job is not only to go and grow, yes, it's to go and make disciples, but also Jesus said, feed my sheep. And do 10 people not deserve a minister because they don't have enough money? We talk about Jesus removing lampstands. Yes, he did that to unfaithful churches. There's a lot of small churches which are faithful which are trying, which may end up dying out, does our revitalization take into account their needs? And I'm not sure if uh, Alistair will tell me the document does take that into account or not. Maybe I'm just skeptical. Maybe that's my problem. But I just wonder if the mission board can say, actually, it's not like that. It might look like that, but we're actually working with small places and we still value small ministries. Thank you. That was a comment couched in a question, question which <laughs> we've moved beyond the time for questions, but uh, he, I'm sure he will answer it in uh, his uh, response to your comments and earlier questions. Would anyone else like to? Evan. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, moderator, and thank you very much for your challenging address this morning. We look forward to receiving that in print when we can further digest it. Thank you very much. I'd like to just comment on a couple of items on page uh, th uh, 24 of the report. Uh, the first one, Women for Mission, and the second one, number five, I would prefer if the live stream was turned off for that. But first of all, uh, women for Mission. I think we do owe a great debt of gratitude to 
the ladies in our church for the amount, the amount of work that they do to raise the profile of mission and also to raise money for very worthy projects. Having lived with a wife for the last 10 years, actually longer than that, but a wife for the last 10 years who has been involved in Women for Mission, uh, I have been privy to quite a lot of the information that, that goes on there. And I would just like to update the, the figure that is mentioned in number three of the report on page 24, that the group there, it says, has raised 36,000 pounds for its spreading the word project. Well, in fact, this uh, sum is now 47,326 pounds at the last count. So I think that's very worthy. Uh, and perhaps still more money might be coming in. So uh, thank you to, to the women for, for all that they do. And now moving on to number five, again, if the live link could be disbanded for a few seconds. I'd just like to uh, mention the Adam Support Group.
you, moderator. Um, I'd just like to uh, refer you to what's on page 28 of the report. Uh, there's a paragraph there about Sterling. I'm Clive Bailey from Sterling, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Mission Board uh, for their £5,000 that they give to every church plant, along with Neil McMillan and maybe others. And we do appreciate the support of the Mission Board. Um, we have, obviously, in the report here a paragraph, which I'm sure you've read about what's happening in Stirling. I think the days of waiting to the assembly to find out what is happening in different parts of the church are long, long past. You can follow us on social media, uh, on the website, or on Facebook. Just look up Stirling Free Church or any other congregation of your choosing to find out what is actually happening uh, on the ground. Uh, we're excited as a church plant uh, to have on our agenda uh, the idea of planting other congregations. Uh, we have a neighboring county uh, in which I currently reside uh, where we have no free church witness at all, Clackmannanshire, with a population of 48,000 people, the town of Alloa, uh, with very little in the way of reform or evangelical witness. We are excited, too, by the presence of uh, a university, uh, we're a university city, and uh, to make contact with the 12 or 15,000 students that are there. And when we think that if we get 20 or 30 of these students along, we're doing well, we remember that there's still 11,900 and something or other to reach. Uh, many of them are international students with absolutely no experience of Christianity whatsoever. Uh, at a recent Bible study with them, uh, we were looking at the opening chapter of the Gospel of Mark, where he refers to what the prophet Isaiah said. We had to explain who the prophet Isaiah was. And, of course, that's in the Old Testament. And the question immediately comes back, what is the Old Testament? And when we recognize that we are dealing with an absolute mission field right on our doorstep of people who have no knowledge whatsoever and never heard the name of Jesus Christ at all, it is exciting and it is thrilling to see what God is doing. We had one of these students uh, from Hong Kong uh, baptized last year, and we look forward to seeing others come to faith. Would like to uh, ask and covet the prayers of uh, the whole church for our brother Murdo Murchison, who, as many of you know, uh, was taken ill last year uh, with a brain tumor and continues uh, to be unwell. And we do ask that you remember him in your prayers. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, moderator. Um, in relation to the document, a, for me the question is, is this document a policy document that if we are adopt it and approve it, then Our congregations, our presbyteries, in doing mission and evangelism, would follow this document. The document has all principles of doing mission. But I think congregations and presbyteries should have a plan and a vision for doing mission and in the evangelism in their own areas. So if a congregation or a presbytery develops a vision or a plan to do mission and, in, and evangelism in, the, in their areas, which vision, which plan is not contained in this document, but which vision does not contravene the principles of this document? Would the missionary board 
approve or accept that plan. Because I think the congregations are well best to find ways of doing mission and evangelism. Now, I'm talking about evangelism a lot because I'm passionate about evangelism. And I've heard people here talking about personal evangelism, evangelists. Now, I have to say, whether you agree me, with me or not, that the greatest need in this nation is the need for evangelists. And I don't see our congregations and even our presbyteries taking this as a priority. And we say, we are, all of us have to make disciples. If that's the case, then each of us is an evangelist. And if we are all evangelists, then we should be equipped to do the work of evangelism. If members of your congregation are evangelists, they should be equipped to do the work of evangelism. And that does not mean that every member of your church will have to go through eight years. No. I think it is incumbent to us as leaders to train our people to do the work of evangelists. Do we have evangelist, evangelism teams in our congregations? So, I think the document is okay, but I'm sorry, I don't see a vision or a plan at congregational level in the document to do mission and evangelism. And I mean, I've seen in the document, the document talking about one man model whereby we have ministers, so the minister is a preacher, he preaches the word of God, he administers sacraments, he is the youth minister, he is a children's minister, he does a pastoral work, he attends meetings, and yet we also expect the minister to go out to the community to one-to-one -to -one evangelism, to do preaching in the workplaces, shops. The minister cannot do all that work. We in the congregation should be able to do that work, but we are not equipped to do that work. We're not trained. Some people in our congregations have got passions for evangelism, but these passions have to be revitalized and inspired. Now, lastly, I would like to encourage you to think, you meaning the mission is board, to think about lay evangelists. Whereby you find people, they know about the scripture, they can share the scripture, but they want to feel that they have been given the tools and the confidence to go and share the scripture. I want to feel that my church is saying, Benson, we are laying hands on you and sending you to go and share the scripture and share the gospel in the community. The idea of lay evangelists is very, very important. These are the people who have got passion for evangelism. And you get them, you give them basic training about how to share the word with the person on the street and they'll go and do it better than any other person. It has happened. I've done it in my country, Uganda. Maybe Uganda is a different context from Scotland. And we have seen people going out, preaching the gospel, coming, people coming to church, planting a church, and even money coming. So unless we do that, we will remain in that corner comfortable and just having documents which perhaps will not make any difference. Let's have some good stories about mission and evangelism. Mr. McRae, Angus. Derek, uh, it's lovely to see you uh, in the chair, and it was great to hear your inspiring talk this morning. Uh, many of us are grateful to you for your ministry and for what you've done for family members and what have you, and the, the model uh, of uh, church planting and revitalization 
that you've shown, uh, and much of that through prayer. And I wanted to come up here and just to speak about how the work of mission uh, has to really go hand in hand with the Lord and with a, a sense of it being real, that for resources and to see hearts change, to see uh, fruit that lasts, the kind of personal work Benson was just telling us about, and uh, things that uh, come out of strategies that we, we really need to uh, have everybody in our congregations on board, that it is a shared task, and that, uh, you know, that, that commitment to ask God to be glorified in mission at home and abroad, to be serious about praying for people. In, in my own context, in, in Rosher, we've been encouraging our people recently to seriously set aside time every day to pray for 10 who do not know the Lord, and that they would come to know the Lord. And I'm sure if we are praying for people, we will be more bold to speak to people as well. We pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And the Lord has told us to do that. But he's also put us, members, adherents, men and women, into that harvest field. And we, we all have our duty to be part of uh, that revitalization and mission task all around us all the time. I wanted to comment with gratitude on the startup grant scheme that the board has been administering. Um, they've been giving seed capital to various projects around the church. Some of them are listed in the report and uh, in 2017 various other projects have benefited. And in my own congregation in Dingwall and Strathpeffer, we have a ministry apprentice who has been partly funded by that startup grant scheme. And uh, the reason I mention it is that many deacons were just wary, you know, if you're trying to raise a lot of money in a year, um, perhaps 15, 20,000 pounds for a project, and you think, that's a big task. How are we going to do it? To be able to say, well, we've applied for a grant, we may or may not get it, helps. Actually, though, once people see a project up and running, they will very often find the resources to give. And uh, I think startup seed funding can be a good way to get a church to see what is achievable and that actually God has probably given us the resources. If there's vision, then the resources will be found to do things that are extending the gospel and the kingdom. Um, so I want to commend that project. I don't think it's money frittered away down the drain at all. I think in, in our context, it's probably led to an increase in giving that is significant and that I'm sure will carry on long beyond the finish of that initial funding. If I could comment on um, a little sense that I have between the report that's before us just now and the report of the trustees that we'll consider on another occasion, I see a wee problem that we, we are dispersing funds for mission and we're talking about sustentation matters under the mission board, and yet policy on um, categories of congregation and the, the level of bands into which congregations fit is being set by the trustees. And I'm, I don't know how good the communication is. We moved to a system a few years ago where essentially the, the level of tax on congregations was dialed back a little bit so that there could be investment locally in growing the kingdom of God. I think the idea being the local church will use its money wisely and well for the kingdom of God. I sense that this may be a, a bit of a return to the way we used to do things. Uh, let's tax a bit more, spend a bit more from the center. And I'm picking that up from both this report and the trustees report. Well, I don't remember having a debate about that, and maybe this is the place to have it, but it seems to me that we haven't given this new system all that long to be changing it. 
and we may well cut off some encouraging signs of growth and development around the church if we go back to a more centralized model. That's just a sense that I have, and I may have misread that. If I could comment about some of the amendments from Mr. Macmillan, I should maybe have asked a question, um, either of Mr. Macmillan or of the convener, uh, about this £250,000 that's being spoken of for a church planting fund. Uh, maybe when the convener responds at the end, he'll be able to tell us, is that money budgeted for at the moment or not? Or is this money that the, the, the mission board hope to go out and raise? Because I think in, in coming to vote on that matter, it would be helpful to know if the trustees have agreed to build this into the budget. Because nobody would be against money to be used in church planting. But if it ends up that we're going to go to the same donors and say, well, at the moment, Esk Valley or Montrose are going directly to you and asking for funding, but now our board is going to go and ask you for that funding so that they can give it, that does seem to be, to, to be going back to the way we used to do things. And uh, it didn't seem to me to work so well. I, I thought Mr. McMillan was fairly measured uh, but it surprised me that he had not been drawn into the councils of the mission board in some of the things that are in the report today, particularly with regard to training church planters. I was really surprised that Mr. McMillan had not been part of the, the production of policy and of advice, and therefore I'm inclined to support Mr. McMillan's amendments the only one I'm not sure about, and I'd like an answer from the convener when he responds, is to clarify this figure of £250,000. Is that money just plucked out of the air, or has there actually been a process that has led to that figure? And uh, depending on how he answers that question, I may be supporting all of Mr. McMillan's amendments, or just two out of three. Mr. Ackroyd, Bob. <clears throat> Bob Ackroyd from Edinburgh Theological Seminary. Thank you, Derek, and congratulations. Thank you for your stimulating address where you challenged us to take a radical look at our structures. And thank you for that sobering assessment which suggested that much of our structure is geared for inertia. As we were reminded by Benson earlier, inertia cannot be an option. The vast majority of Scotland is outside of the kingdom. The vast majority of Scotland is in dire spiritual jeopardy of which they are completely unaware. In a sense, not much changes. In the beginnings of our denomination, Thomas Chalmers made a similarly sobering observation. He said, in agreeing with one of his contemporaries, he said that the vast majority of evangelical ministers did not have the ability to lay down the gospel in a way that a man of ordinary understanding could pick it up. And sometimes I think if we're taking a radical look at our structures, we need to take a radical look at ourselves. And I think that we presume that we preach the gospel better than we do or we are better able to lay down this gospel in a way that ordinary people can pick it up. Near the end of the last century, in the 19th century, an American fellow called D.L. Moody had a profound experience with God and felt called by God to bring the gospel to the entire population of the world within his own lifetime. In a sense, he failed in that endeavor but having preached personally to 100 million people, he gave a good shot. Both Thomas Chalmers and D.L. Moody in different ways at different times from different, different uh, backgrounds encouraged us to think big, to think big with regard to the gospel and to think big with regard to the impact of the gospel. I think what we are being encouraged through the mission board 
through the strategy document is to begin to think big. I'd like to say that we as a church are geared for evangelism, that we are geared to reach this nation with the gospel. I don't think we're there yet, but the more we talk and the more we plan and the more we pray and the more we uh, dream these bold and big visions, we may see God again working. I was reminded that uh, when, when I heard Neil speaking, when I heard Clive speaking, I was reminded of camp this past summer in North Uist. And we saw very clearly there the, the, the um, fruit of Douglas McMillan's ministry. Doug, Douglas McMillan preached in Aberdeen and a young un undergraduate named Clive Bailey. That's hard to imagine now, but a young man called Clive Bailey went to church, had no knowledge of the gospel, but that was then. This is now. The gospel changed Clive's life and through Clive and Ruth, their family, and two of their grandsons were at the U.S. camp, Christians themselves. Jim and Kirsty Boyd in Glasgow wanted to get married. They spoke to the local free church minister, hoping that he would agree to marry them. They got more than they bargained for. And as they came to faith, they passed on their faith to their children, and one of the camp leaders, David Boyd, was a demonstration of the ongoing ministry and fruit of Douglas's uh, ministry in Glasgow. Then Douglas was in the college, and then he left the college to be preacher at Baclou. Now, I never met Douglas, but I had the privilege of listening to Douglas on tape, and I heard there the gospel powerfully, persuasively presented. My life was never the same. We need to equip, identify, encourage and enthuse men and women with this same passion for the gospel, a desire to see lost souls saved, to see families and communities transformed. Because every one of us that's involved in pastoral ministry could give a list of the tragedies that we have all been involved in in one way or another. Broken lives, broken homes, broken families. The reality of loss, the reality of death, the reality of suffering. And we and we alone have the answer to this world and to this society and to this nation's darkness and troubles, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No mission document, no strategy document, no committee, no general assembly can transform the nation of Scotland. But if this document and this discussion prompts us to pray, to speak, to encourage, and maybe to identify that next generation those that will take the place of you, Derek, of Neil, David Meredith. We're all growing old. We need a new generation who can rise with greater passion, greater ability, greater fluency, greater vision, greater passion to preach and to proclaim this good news concerning Jesus. So I encourage the mission board and I encourage us to listen to what Neil is saying because Neil is not just a talker, Neil is a practitioner. You want to know about church revitalization? Neil McMillan can tell you. You want to know about church planting? Neil is the man that we would naturally go to. So when Neil speaks, we need to listen. So thank you, moderator. Anyone else? Mr. Fraser, James. Moderator, um, let me congratulate you on your office and also on the superb address that you give us today. Uh, my name's James Fraser. I'm an elder in Kiltarnity Free Church. I've been around a while, and I remember a young minister called Derek Lamond out there and my predecessor, um, been well and truly trounced, being asked difficult questions about the church's investments. Um, my predecessor was very good at giving answers, but I don't think he gave the answers that
Derek was wanting. And I think it's an interesting situation. Time and wisdom can change people. And you guys who may give me a hard time tomorrow, you may find in a few years you're a Derek. You're a poacher turned gamekeeper. Anyway, welcome. And can I also uh, say congratulations to the outgoing chairman of the mission board. Bringing the boards together was a risky task and lots of people said to the board of trustees that they were wrong to do so. Now, you know how we all love saying, I told you so, we were right to do so, but I think the fact that we're having this debate today is a great tribute to the very hard work and the clear thinking that was brought to the task of mission by the outgoing chairman. And I think he deserves a really big thank you from the assembly because you don't do these things uh, without a lot of sweat. I want to, if I'm allowed to and don't run out of time, say a few things about all the different things that we're talking about. Angus raised interesting questions about finance and more will be said about that tomorrow. Uh, I think people have perhaps forgotten, and I'll remind you tomorrow about an act. People get budgets. They cannot budget overrun unless the Board of Trustees agrees. And even if the assembly legislates to spend money that we don't have, the assembly has already legislated that that is subject to the board's agreement. So remember, any budget overrun that's approved this week, it's not approved until the board agree to the budget overrun. And that is enshrined in an act. It's not the board's policy, it's the assembly's policy. Um, and I think people should perhaps bear that in mind. Now, what the mission board are asking for is a different thing. They're not asking for a budget overrun. They're asking that when the Board of Trustees comes to consider what I call the taxation system, they'll give consideration inter alia to trying to identify a way of securing a fund that would be used to assist church planting. That's what they're asking for. They're not asking for a budget overrun. And if people are confused, we'll try and clarify this further tomorrow. I want to say something about the strategy plan and the Neil McMillan Amendment. Um, of course, the strategy plan is imperfect. It's very long. It needs a lot of work to read it and understand it. But we have been told that uh, the mission board are going to produce a shortened version that will be more accessible. Now, in an ideal world, you might think the best thing to do is to do what Neil's asking, delay approval of the plan and do more consultation. I absolutely think that's the wrong thing to do. People will not respond to more consultation. It was pretty hard to get responses to the consultation process that the board enacted. I think it would be far better for the assembly to follow the deliverance, adopt the plan, send it out, but for the chairman to say, if he's not out with his, uh, his board's policy, everything is subject to semper reformanda. If when sessions get it, they don't like it, they think it's wrong, they think it's this, they think it's that. that this feedback is encouraged because it's only when the document is a reality and people are having to follow it that they it so seriously that they will really consult back, that they will really feed back. And I see no reason and no incompatibility in saying, let's adopt this strategy, but let's be open to further reform of the plan if indeed when adopted it galvanizes people into much more feedback than even the mission board got through its strategic process. I love the fact that the document starts by reminding us that our task is to make disciples and also in so doing to make disciple makers. I actually think the biggest barrier to our growth as a church has been that 
most of my life in the free church, I and others have been working on the wrong model. We thought that our duty was to drag people to the minister, and it was his duty to convert them. We thought that unless we preach Genesis to Revelation to people when we met them in the street, we were, not, we were ineffective witnesses. We were not trained as a generation to understand how to engage with people because we took comfort in this model. It was the minister's job to do that. It was our job to try and bring people to the minister. Now, I'm not saying the model was totally bad, but it was a model for Christendom. It was a model for a society that was already uh, Christian or was st still working of residual Christian worldviews. Definitely not a model for growth. And I think it's great that at long last we're beginning to tackle this barrier. Now, I want to say a little about the amendment that I found myself seconding with Neil Macmillan. It was just a temptation to be the face of the new conservatism. But seriously speaking, this is the amendment about not having the cracks built into the committee. Now, you might think, what a hypocrite. The Board of Trustees uh, has the assembly have the assembly clerks sitting on its, on, on its board. But actually, there are times when the assembly clerk has to say to the chairman of these boards, whoa, you can't do what you're wanting to do. Um, and they've got to be very independent, and they've got to give their advice from an, an independent view. And I think having them there is absolutely essential. Board of Trustees, we couldn't work if we couldn't ask the Assembly Clerk to advise us. But building them in seems to me to be making a picture that perhaps their independence isn't as well protected as it should be. And we absolutely need independent clerks because the bigger the committees are, and the more things they do, the more temptation it is for people to take shortcuts and for people to try and get around some of the very wise legislation that we have. So I find myself in support of this new, this neoconservative, Neil Macmillan, uh, and that's why I seconded his motion. Uh, finally, I want to say something about my dear friend at Sky, and I, I'm on the Sky Press, but I'm almost frightened to do this. But please don't approve his addendum. Let me say why. First of all, um, I have had to explain to other congregations why they are not allowed to do what he's asking. And I think it's very unfair if we suddenly allow one person to do it. And I'm really sorry for his daughter and the effect this is going to have if I get my way of it. Um, but you know, underneath that benign exterior, there's a steely argument going on over this. So don't be deceived, folks. He's, he's great at persuading you. But the other reason is that the Board of Trustees went to the very edges of what we could get off with in terms of risk management and in terms of not having people batter us for not allowing them uh, what they wanted on previous occasions in the package that we put together for the Portree building. And we did that to make life as comfortable as we possibly could because this is a very brave congregation who are taking on a big commitment uh, but wow isn't it great that they have to they have to because they don't have enough room we looked at their finances and we do think they can just about afford the building and the assistance ship and i think it would be desperately unfair to the people that i have said no you can't do that if we let this through, so please don't let it through. This is not about preserving old bureaucratic legislation. This is just about behaving in a just and a fair way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now time is moving on, so I'm proposing uh, that we move forward to uh, let the chairman respond and uh, then vote on the amendments, which I will explain how to do forthwith. First of all, can I thank you all those who have come up to speak. It's not easy speaking at the podium up here, but I do appreciate those who've taken the time to do so. Um, David Miller, it was helpful to be reminded that there are others who question what's going on in ICRC. Um, and question uh, the validity of continuing to be involved in it. Um, I'm heartened that there is more 
cooperation and more practical outcomes from it, and uh, we hope that will be the case going forward. I'm thankful to John for drawing attention to Sarah's role. Uh, she will thank him for that, no doubt. Uh, but Sarah is uh, hugely instrumental in what we do, and it was appropriate that we do thank her for that. Given the fact she wrote most of the report was probably why there was nothing mentioned uh, in the deliverances about the mission coordinator. Uh, with regard to Kenny Boyd, I uh, appreciate the comments. Um, you uh, brought the potential for say a congregation doing a development plan uh, and the presbytery coming up with some kind of plan for their area and the mission board somehow being out of sync. Um, I don't think that is a realistic scenario given the fact uh, a lot of the materials that are being used uh, to come up with a congregational development plan, a lot of the direction that will be given from the mission director um, is with this overall strategy from the board in view anyway. And likewise, the role that the mission director has in communicating with the various presbyteries of the denomination uh, to try and stimulate and help and, and direct with regard to having a, a vision for their own locality, again, that's not at variance with an overarching plan for the mission of the church. So uh, what I would try and say to maybe allay any fears that you have is that I do think it's far more likely that they're going to be more in sync than we perhaps appreciate at this point, given some of the other factors that have been uh, included in that. I want to thank Don McPherson from North Harris. Uh, give him a warm welcome. Uh, I want to thank him for uh, his, his comments, um, uh, many of which I, I find helpful. Um, just one thing to maybe respond to your comments. Uh, you implied the role of the mission director perhaps to uh, have in his remit going round educating about some of our mission interests. Um, and I am heartened that there was such a positive response uh, to hearing in congregations about the mission interests that the church is involved in. Um, I know in the congregation I used to serve, I, we did a Sunday evening slot reminding folks of what exactly the church does. And people who'd been in the church for decades had no idea of some of the various arms of our mission uh, work that's involved. However, that is not necessarily a job for the mission director. I think we need to be very clear that the mission director, uh, his role is extensive uh, as it is. The mission board recognized that and uh, we have actually a, a kind of agreement on the board that the members of the mission board who are based in different localities, different presbyteries, would actually take it upon themselves to try and go to at least a congregation or two per year to share what actually is done on an international level as well as on a, on a national level from the mission board. And I think that would be the way forward to do that rather than uh, amending the job description of the mission director to allow that to take place. It's just not feasible unless we're expecting him to practice ubiquity. And although he's good, he's not that good. So. Uh, Dan Patterson, thank you for um, that reminder about small congregations. Uh, one of the discussions that we've had over the past couple of years is how do we actually assess congregational viability? Because it is not simply a case of finances, it cannot be. And it isn't simply and cannot be a case of numbers. But there has to be some way of trying to make an objective assessment as to the viability or otherwise of, of current works and of future works. And I think it was helpful to be reminded uh, of many small groups throughout the country, and there needs to be some kind of ministry provision for them. Uh, and that's at times where uh, presbyteries have to make some, some difficult decisions, but also have to come up with some innovative thinking as to how to provide ministry in some of these areas. So it was a helpful reminder, Dan, about the need for us to be conscious of smaller congregations. Evan, thank you for uh, informing us of the updated figure of the Women for Mission uh, appeal for this year, quite an outstanding figure that they have reached, and we do uh, congratulate them for that. Ivor, thank you that you broke the mold and came up and spoke positively about the Mission Board strategy. You said you were inspired by it. Uh, by it. Uh, I could have gone home at that point. So uh, thank you, thank you for that. That's very, very helpful. Um, it was also encouraging to hear that the Sterling congregation are at this moment uh, still thinking of planting other congregations. We recently went through a vision strategy session in the, with the Smithton leadership and uh, the chap who uh, facilitated that gave us a statistic that if a church didn't plant another church within five years, it was highly likely that they ever would plant a church, um, which was quite an interesting statistic. 
Uh, I don't know how accurate it is, but it's a good statistic. But it's great to see that the Serling congregation have that focus, not simply to establish one work, but multiple works. And good also to be reminded to pray for Murdo. Many of us have been and are praying for him. Benson, thank you for uh, your passion and your enthusiasm and reminding us of the need for evangelists. I absolutely agree with you, and thank you for that. Um, Angus uh, McCree, uh, appreciate the various different uh, comments that you've shared with us there. I hope that how James responded to the uh, issue with regard to the, uh, the funding for the church plant made some sense to you. And I'm thankful that the development fund was such an encouragement to your congregation. Uh, may I remind you there is still money in the development fund. Uh, there's about 20,000 that's still there. Uh, if you want to know more information about how that development fund can be accessed, then please do contact Sarah, uh, our mission coordinator, and she'll uh, enable you to find out more about that. Um, Bob McRoyd, uh, appreciate your comments as ever, and uh, look forward to uh, you leading this committee going forward. Uh, appreciate that. And for, for finally, for James, um, I absolutely agree with what James says about the strategy document. The strategy document is, by its very uh, nature, the way it's being constructed, it is an ongoing conversation. It is not uh, this final uh, set in concrete kind of scenario that uh, congregations are going to be beaten up because they haven't an X, Y, or Z within it. It is a conversation, but it, we need to have a conversation starter. This is it. And uh, I will refer back to this more fully when we uh, address some of the amendments. But I, I heartily agree with uh, what James was uh, concluding there. Um, and I don't think I've got any other comments to make other than that. Uh, and other than to say, if any of you do get the opportunity in years to come uh, to serve on the mission board, uh, take that opportunity with both hands. It is an absolute privilege to be involved in the work of the church in so many different levels. So if you do get the opportunity as an, either as an elder or as a minister, uh, please don't think it'll be an inconvenience. It is an absolute pleasure to be involved in that. Moderator, do I speak now about the amendments? Uh, addenda? Yeah. Okay. So in order, we're going with our peachy color. Amendment number one, um, given by Neil. Um, so that... I may, be, I may be doing your job, so I better stop. <laughs> Are you, I'm okay? Do you have the amendment before you? So you've got the amendment, the, the, the peachy one, which is to delete paragraph A9, um, which speaks of having uh, a representative from the clerk's office sitting on the mission board. Um, I have to say that as outgoing chairman of the board, it has been hugely helpful having one of the clerks present with us, not least to keep us from overstepping the mark, um, as well as being part of the process that leads to decision making. Now, whether the assembly wished to have that uh, role as a mere consultant, to join with the other consultants that we have on the board, for instance, we have uh, Principal Martin, who sits as a consultant on the board, we have uh, consultants from WFM and from Inspire and, and others as we see necessary. Whether the Assembly wishes the clerk's office to be represented as a consultant or as an officially appointed um, post, I'm happy for the Assembly to decide that one. Do we do that in turn or do I just give no, all my answers? All just go through all the answers. Okay. Uh, Addenda number two. So this is the pink one um, about strategy. Um, it's always a dangerous thing to disagree with Neil McMillan, um, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to. Um, but I do genuinely, <laughs> he's surprised, I do genuinely uh, appreciate, however, his comments, his wisdom, uh, and his wit as he articulated uh, some of his concerns. Uh, maybe before I say any, anything further, um, Neil did feed into our uh, our responses. Uh, we got very helpful response from Neil, so please don't think that Neil somehow hadn't been involved in this. Uh, he was, so I just want to make that clear. Um, let me also make something clear that we have not yet baked the cake. Um, I'm talking about sticking the cake in the oven after today, but we've not yet baked it. Why? Because that would have been presumptuous. 
because we were presenting this today and any of you could have come forward with uh, ad additions or subtractions or clarifications that you wanted that would have then been taken into the strategy document and at that point it would have gone into the oven and it would have been baked. So it's not, uh, hasn't been a done deal. You had the opportunity today to come with various different uh, amendments to some of the details <coughs> that wasn't taken um, and on the basis that there wasn't any further whisking, uh, then hopefully we bake it. Let me address the points that um, Neil so very eloquently raised. Uh, first of all, uh, measurable actions. There are 90 or so action points within, uh, within the document. Uh, there was a discussion when the document was being composed as to whether we put the action points in. Uh, if we put them in, they'll be criticised. If we don't put them in, we'll be criticised for not putting them in. And then, how many do we put in? Because if we put so many in, uh, it may appear light, and if we put too many in, it's going to appear heavy. And so you get the impression that you're almost in a lose-lose situation, irrespective of how much detail you put in here. There are action points put in there, however, and these action points are going to be uh, the, the basis upon which the board is then going to move forward, prioritizing these points and trying to enable not simply the board themselves, but uh, if requested, to enable the presbyteries and the congregations to adopt that, as well as the other boards, if there's anything that can be done to help. These points will be prioritized. Had we come with a list of priorities today, I'm pretty sure we would have people saying, well, why is this priority number three rather than priority number one? So I, I see where Neil's coming from. I, I don't necessarily disagree, but I think that will be done. And I think that's going to be part of the process moving forward. Secondly, a word about procedure. Um, and uh, obviously I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, the presbyteries were given on the 9th of December last year uh, copies of the strategy document as well as copies of the timetable of how this is going to move forward. And it was given in an email format. Uh, I know certain presbyteries emailed it out at that point. I'm not sure if all presbyteries did. Uh, but from the 9th of December, is when the presbyteries had this initial document. The response date was the 15th of February. So you had over, there was over two months of a response date. Uh, when that original correspondence was given to the presbyteries, it was included in that original correspondence that there would be a date in April whereby a consultation process would take place. And given the nature of the, the document as we kind of built upon the previous documents and had to refine and take on board some of the responses, uh, the date that was chosen uh, managed to have representation, uh, I believe, from every part of the church uh, for that meeting in Inverness. Edinburgh and Perth Presbytery were represented. And so while it was in school holidays in the south of the country, it wasn't in the north of the country or in the west of the country. And so it was difficult to get a date because we had to get this ready for here um, and it has been it has been consulted so uh, i don't accept it was rushed given the fact that there was these processes beforehand that three years um going through the uh, the finer details of mission through the local church that wasn't something that we had to start from scratch on that was already there we were building on it and building on it during the period of time the mission board's been in existence uh, I don't believe it was rushed. Thirdly, a change in philosophy. Uh, Neil indicated that he felt this was going to be uh, a move back to the past of centralization of more of a heavy-handed, top-down approach. Uh, in my introduction earlier on today, I tried to uh, mention, uh, hopefully quite clearly, but evidently not, uh, that the board is there to try and to facilitate local mission. We're not there to try and be an obstacle to local mission. We're not there to try and hinder or slow down in any way local mission. We're trying to facilitate it. And we're trying to facilitate it in such a way that the last thing we want is to be the fulcrum around which everything operates, whether it's local congregations or presbyteries or the assembly. That's not our intention at all. And so I, I don't see how uh, we actually have that, that sense of it being a heavy-handed top-down approach. Let me give you an illustration. On page five of the strategy document, it says, second paragraph, again, it is the prerogative of presbyteries as to how far they pursue the suggestions of the board. The board will offer assistance as appropriate 
and as a recapturing the vision of the presbytery as a radical core to the church. This is not a heavy-handed centralization process. That is not our intention in any way at all. Finally, let me just emphasize with regard to this particular uh, agenda that the ethos here is that there's going to be an ongoing, congregation, an ongoing conversation uh, that does feed back from local congregations to us, that does feed back from presbyteries, and likewise that we can feed into it. Um, and so this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But this is an ongoing conversation. Now, I could mention finance, but I'm going to mention that in the next agenda. So, just to sum up, for these reasons, I cannot accept Neil's amendment, but I am convinced that the new chairman and the board will look seriously at the issues that have been raised, so that hopefully we'll end up with a jelly baby cake in some kind of nice format. Um, so, it is time to bake the cake. So, that's why... I cannot accept that second agenda, and the assembly are going to make a decision. Can I move to number three? Okay. Number three, we're on the green sheet. And this is to do with financing church plants. I nearly fell off my seat at one point in Neil's uh, eloquent speech when he said that they don't need money. Um, I have spent couple of years trying to persuade the Board of Trustees, we do need money, um, and we do need money. Okay, I think there's a degree of cross-purposes here. I think there's a straw man who has been shot, speared, and set on fire this afternoon. I do not think that we are looking in any way for the Board to somehow interrupt or hinder the funding processes that church planters are having to go through to try and secure the, the works that they're involved with. Far from it. We just want to help them. And we do think that a paltry £5,000 per year for three years to a congregation or to a new church plant is next to nothing when you consider that they need, as a pretty much a minimum, £50,000 per year to survive. So what we're wanting to do more money to give them, not to fully fund it at all, but even the difference having another £5,000 per year would actually give would be significant. And, and on the basis of that, I do respectfully disagree with my brother Neil uh, that we don't need money. We need to have some more money. Um, the, the proposal that's in the deliverance about having some fund for 250,000 uh, was partly designed to get a reaction because the church needs to know how little we are supporting our church plants and the church needs to know that we must actually do something about it. Um, and so I don't think what was being suggested by, by Neil about this somehow being another factor of the centralization and the slowing down from the church plant per year to church plant per four years, I don't think that's it at all. I think that is a straw man. We just want to help and help more. The reality is if we were approached on the mission board, or the board would be approached in June, I'm not going to be there, they're thankful for that. If they were going to be approached in June by another congregation and said, we're going to plant a church, can you give us 5,000? We have no money to give them. We don't even have 5,000 pounds to give them. So the notion that we don't need money is untrue. We do. It's a question of how we fund it. However, in saying all these things, I'm quite happy to accept Neil's addendum on this one. Number four. And, sorry, I should clarify. I'm happy because I know the Board of Trustees are going to look at the issue and it's going to come up later. Number four. The addendum from Portree and Donny G. This is the yellow page, I believe. Ah, uh, this is not an easy one. Um, I'm trying to have my split personality from a personal point of view. Uh, I have one opinion as to what should happen here. Uh, from my position as the chairman of the board, I, I have a different opinion, and therefore I'm contradicting myself. And when I get to the stage of contradicting myself, I obviously can't make decisions, so other people are going to have to. 
So I'm going to hand this back over to you. I have huge sympathy uh, with the Portree uh, situation, uh, but I do think that given the fact there will be financial implications for the work of the Mission Board uh, and for other uh, elements of the funding of the wider church, I think the Assembly need to make a decision uh, on this particular issue. As I say, I have huge sympathy for this, the situation there, uh, but the Assembly are going to have to make a decision on that one. That's me. Okay. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you for your responses and for uh, your presentation today. So, at this point, we will take each of the... Uh, there'll be four to vote on. Is that right? One has been accepted. The Green uh, Amendment has been accepted. So, we will vote on the other amendments, starting with the orange one. Three left, sorry. We haven't dealt with the, uh, the fifth one. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> so the first uh, amendment, uh, if we can have the proposer and the seconder of the amendment to come up. That's you, Neil. And your seconder. It's uh, the deleting paragraph A9. If we can maybe have them up again on the screen, that would be possibly helpful. Uh, Orange Amendment. Peach. Peach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and move on second. So we'll take uh, the vote for the amendment first. Uh, put your hands up if you are voting for the amendment against the original uh, proposal uh, in the papers. So hands up for the amendment. Okay. And for the uh, deliverance? Amendment carries. So, Mr. McMillan, you can stay here for the second amendment, which is in pink. That's the Great Free Church Bake Off. Uh, <laughs> to decide whether this is something that should be uh, put in the oven or is already in the oven or maybe is coming out of the oven. We're not quite sure. So, uh, we'll again have the amendment, which is up on the screens. Seconder. Another Macmillan. It was indeed. Bit of nepotism going on here. Reverse nepotism. So you have the amendment again. Uh, hands up for the those who wish to support the amendment against the deliverance. Okay, and for the deliverance? The deliverance carries. Looks like it's cooked. <laughs> deliverance carries. As the proposer says, it looks like it's cooked. 
baked. Now, the third amendment was accepted. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, an addendum, which is the addendum from Reverend Donnie G. MacDonald, um, who is a seconder, Martin Cameron. That is also on your screens. So can we have votes for those who would agree with uh, this proposed addendum to the deliverance? Okay, and for the deliverance, close, close. Okay, the deliverance carries. Mr. McDonald. Assembly's indulgence. Uh, the instruction I've been given is to ask that the petition of um, Portray and Brackadale to have the uh, right to appoint an assistant minister be withdrawn or at least postponed until the commission or to the next assembly, please. Uh, I think, would it be within the gift of the the board? Part of the board's report, so it's entirely in line with the commission. So, to be clear, it would potentially come back at the Commission of Assembly, is that true? The idea would be if, if we were in a position where we felt that imminently we could appoint um, an assistant, we would do so. But since we're not in that position, the truth is the funds would not be there to, to pay, and we don't want to be have the, uh, the right to appoint an assistant and not be able to, to pay the required amount in defiance of the... So, is it permissible then for this to be potentially brought back at the Commission of Assembly? Can it, be, until the Commission. can it be delegated and held over? Is that, is that doable? So the Commission of Assembly would be approved to receive an application from the Portray and Bragdale congregation? Okay, uh, well, in that case, I'm quite happy to accept that. So do the Assembly uh, agree to empower the Commission in October to deal with this matter uh, as it's a reapplication is made? So from that, I take it there's no counter motion. I should have asked for that first. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, can I just give the, the outline of what's happening? Uh, we have an order of the day at four o'clock. We also have uh, where delegates will be welcomed and invited to speak. Uh, we also have the next section of the uh, mission board report, which is the youth uh, with regard to youth. Um, so we'll take that in four minutes. Okay, so you've got four minutes to stretch your legs 
to visit uh, the little boy's room uh, or whatever else you want to do, uh, just to get a bit of fresh air. But please do come back sharp for four in four minutes' time. Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Right. Get them back in. Thank you. 
again, please. We've decided to have the delegates first and then have the youth report. Fine, fine. I didn't want to squeeze the youth thing in. Oh, nice. Gentlemen, can I encourage you to take your seats? I know ministers like to talk. Okay. Yes, a slight adjustment. Uh, rather than trying to squeeze a few minutes of uh, uh, the youth section of the mission report in at this point, we're going to uh, bring forward the order of the day. And uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, David Meredith, who will uh, introduce our delegates, uh, who will then be encouraged to address the assembly. Moderator, we have uh, this year three delegates, uh, international delegates. I suppose England is international. Um, we don't do England. Um, may I introduce, first of all, the Reverend Thomas Dreyer from the Reformed Churches in South Africa. Thomas is a minister in Johannesburg, and uh, he is a very good friend of our denomination, has been here on uh, at least one occasion, and I would like to invite you to invite him to address the assembly. It's great to have you uh, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. You're invited to address the brethren. Thank you, moderator. Moderator, fathers and, and brothers, it's uh, always a privilege to stand before you to represent my denomination, the Reformed Church in South Africa. Our relationship with the Free Church of Scotland is one of our oldest ecumenical relationship and therefore very special to us. Um, but it's also spe special to me personally, as some of you might know. Uh, just the last week I spent with Reverend Kruger de Kock in Canada Water Church in London. And so I'm glad to also send these greetings uh, and, and tell you that it's going well with them and the ministry. And I believe it's going so well with uh, the ministry in London, England, David. Um, it's going so well with, with this ministry because it was built on the foundations of ecumenical relationships. It was really the work of two denominations coming together. And then especially uh, the, the congregations of London City Presbyterian Church with the, the great help and support given by Cobham. And especially I want to mention just Reverend David Miller and his wife, Meg, until they've relocated, still keeping contact with, with Kruger. We were reflecting in the week on what a big influence your denomination had on um, uh, us uh, and um, especially the London, London congregations um, and their elders on our ministry. My ministry up until today has been largely influenced by your denomination and uh, the ministers. Uh, uh, moderator, fathers and, and brothers, I'm grateful to be able to tell you that it's going well with the Reformed Churches in South Africa. For those of you who do not know, the GKSA, the Gereformeerde Kerk in South Africa, is more than 150 years old. We have about 100,000 members in 397 congregations all over South Africa. Now, if I say it's going well, I have to explain what I mean uh, by that, because for, uh, a mere, from a mere human perspective, we are facing difficult times in South Africa. Uh, some of the same stuff as you do, secularism, materialism has not passed us by. The prosperity gospel, which is plaguing our continent, continent is also plaguing our country. Um, amidst this, we have many congregations without full-time ministers because of the financial difficulties we are facing as a country. Economically, it's really tough times for us. The growing gap between rich and poor, coupled with a lack of leadership from our government, uh, which includes not dealing strictly with corruption, this all creates a very fertile ground for crime in our country, which is uh, very bad. 
And although the official system of apartheid has been dismantled many years ago, segregation and, uh, and racism and xenophobia still stuff that we struggle with. Um, all of this uh, causes a lot of uncertainty and it's still making many people leave for other countries such as your own. Just speaking with a couple of you um, South Africa families in your churches, we are thankful for our ecumenical ties once again, which helps us to find these people good churches to come home to if they move country. Um, so, uh, in general, it's tough times, and yet I'm willing to stand before you and to say that it is going well, and here's why. It's because our trustworthy God is still in our midst, and He's dwelling in us richly through His living word. He's, he's teaching us to take up His command through James when He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And one of the ways in which these trying times have influenced us for the better is that, we, that it created a new zeal for spreading the gospel of reconciliation as, we, as we've read this morning, witnessing to the hope that only the resurrected Christ can give in times like these. Deputies for church growth have been tasked to equip congregations with a new vision to reach their local communities where God called them to be church rather than just getting involved in mission trips to far off places, much of what you've been discussing today. There's a new emphasis on church planting as a means of growing God's kingdom in, in which I'm personally also very much in, involved. And the last thing I want to mention which gives me great hope is, is the growing unity amongst black and white congregations in our denomination amidst growing racial division in our country. Throughout the apartheid era, our church has witnessed to our unity in Christ by coming together in a general assembly of black and white churches. But on a local level, this unity was never adequately expressed. A couple of years back, however, a structural change change was made, bringing churches of different cultures together on a local presbytery level. And this brought its own challenges, for example, the language that we use. We have 11, 11 official languages, but uh, in Christ, this challenge proves to be a blessing, because in, in the local uh, presbytery where I serve, for instance, we have uh, Afrikaans-speaking people, um, myself an Afrikaans speaker, the Zulus, the Sutu ministers and elders giving up their privilege of speaking their mother tongue, and we meet in English for the sake of our unity in Christ. Knowing what a big thing this is in our context of division and segregation, it gives me great, great hope for the future. And God is really using this witness of people sacrificing for each other and uniting over racial and cultural boundaries in a powerful way. And our hope is that this, this will be an encouraged uh, meant to uh, the people of our country, and it is um, uh, an, an encouragement. So I hope, I hope this message will encourage you, um, our testimony, as I've been encouraged once again by your testimony, just being with you today was just so great. And let me also end with a, with a verbal invite to our Senate at the beginning of next year. We have not had a representative from the Preachers of Scotland in some years, and it would be of great encouragement to have someone there. You heard David's, uh, David Miller's plea also. I think it's an important synod coming up, and I believe we will need some of the wisdom of our older and wiser sisters, sister churches. So please, please do come and visit us. Our prayer for you is that the living word of God, Jesus Christ, will indeed dwell in you richly through his written word and spirit here in the assembly, but also when you leave to go and be church where he called you to be in this world. So moderator and fathers and brethren, I thank you on behalf of the Reformed Churches in South Africa. Thomas, can I thank you for uh, encouraging and uh, sharing with us I could listen to your accent all night, <laughs> and uh, it's so refreshing and uh, enthusiastic, and we're excited to know uh, of what God is doing through your denomination. So thank you for taking the time uh, to come with us, and uh, we will, I hope, be able to send a representative to uh, share with you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, moderator, the next... Um,
delegate is the Reverend Graham Nichols, who ministers in Hayward's Heath and is the director of Affinity. I would like to ask you to invite him to address the General Assembly. It's great to have you. We look forward to hearing what you have to say to us and I give you the floor of the Assembly. Thank you. I don't have an accent, I'm afraid. Or maybe I do to you, I don't know. In my head, it's just normal. Um, thank you for your welcome. Uh, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, like Paul in Philippians 1.3, I pray for you with joy uh, because of our partnership in the gospel. It's great to go to a place like, that and, like this and instantly uh, feel at home with brothers and sisters in Christ um, and feel like we're, we're dealing with the same issues, we're seeking to serve the same God. Around 1952, uh, four people had an idea, two from the FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, and two from uh, the Free Church of Scotland, George Collins and Murdoch McRae. And they together formed an organization called the British Evangelical Council, BEC, which later became Affinity. And uh, my sort of part-time job is being a director of that organization, Affinity. Probably had its heyday uh, in the 1960s when Martin Lloyd Jones was was very much kind of in support of it uh, and found a kind of refuge there from uh, uh, the troubles he was having in evangelicalism more broadly. Uh, but other denominations and groups have joined. We're not a denomination; we're just a network of denominations, Christian uh, organisations, charities, uh, and kind of networks that aren't denominations themselves that become part of us, and a few couple of hundred uh, independent churches uh, who belong to us as well. And I became director about a year ago. What we're trying to do uh, is a few things well. We're not the big organization that we were. There are many other conferences and publications going on, so we're not trying to, to compete with all of those. But we do want to encourage people who are committed to God and his word uh, to fellowship together and to learn from one another. I think our experience is that there's a massive evangelical realignment going on, a massive redefinition of what it is uh, to be someone who, who and we're seeking to draw together a, a network of churches who, uh, as far as we can see, are faithful to God uh, and to his word, who can learn from each other and encourage one another. So we want to encourage that. Uh, we do some publications. Uh, we publish uh, a printed version of something called In Touch, which just shares news and good practice across the churches. We publish online a theological journal called Foundations. Have a look on our website, affinity.org.uk, and you can read it for free, and all the back issues going back over 20 or 30 years. Uh, and we publish a social issues bulletin, which deals with bioethical issues, um, uh, issues in parliament and law, uh, and other social issues that are going on and tries to give a Christian perspective on those, uh, education as well. And the last thing that we're trying to do, which is a new thing really for Affinity, and it's the thing I'm very passionate about, is seeking to provide uh, an evangelical, conservative evangelical voice in the public square. Uh, we have a strategy this year of seeking to raise the profile of Affinity. Uh, we're trying to do that a little bit through uh, the Christian press, first of all, uh, I've been interviewed by a couple of Christian radio stations. We've got a regular column in a, in a magazine called Evangelicals Now. Uh, but also, as we do that, seeking to get a bit of profile in the secular press too. Uh, I know you have your, your successes, particularly with David Robertson here in Scotland, but uh, across the UK more widely, uh, the conservative evangelical voice is, is hardly heard. Uh, we're seeking to, to uh, redress that. Uh, I did get interviewed on Easter Sunday by uh, BBC Radio London. Uh, which was a, a good experience, managed to talk a little bit about the gospel, managed to get contradicted by a, a Sikh uh, theologian, if you can have Sikh and the theology put together but, um, afterwards, but at least it was an opportunity and, and I think there will be others that follow in the wake. So please uh, pray, take an interest, follow us on Twitter or Facebook or the website um, or just sign up to get the uh, regular email from us. I, I do an email every month just saying what I've been up to and things that are going on. Uh, so I appreciate your fellowship. Hope I haven't used more than my five minutes. Uh, thank you and God bless you. We do appreciate uh, the work of Affinity and uh, you've uh, 
uh, highlighted a lot of challenges there for yourself and uh, the organization, and uh, you can be assured of our prayers as you move forward. Thanks very much. We now uh, cross the world, the new world. Uh, welcome the Reverend Dr. John van der Stoep from the Canadian Reformed Churches. Again, an old friend of our denomination, and I would invite you, moderator, to ask Dr. van der Stoep to address the General Assembly. And it's uh, great to have you, and I look forward to what you have to say to the gathered assembly. Moderator, fathers, brethren, brothers in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is indeed a great honor for me to be here today to address you on behalf of the Canadian Reformed Churches. While I'm doing the address, I am joined by my fellow delegate, Reverend Carl Van Dam, who's sitting over on the side here. <clears throat> Excuse me. As two churches, we've had formal contact since 1993. However, our interactions have been relatively limited over that period of time or since that time. And I think maybe, as was mentioned in the missions report, uh, fraternal relations, ecumenical relations don't necessarily mean that much to the um, individual member of the church, maybe not even to some of the pastors of the church. And therefore, because of our infrequency of interaction, it might be worthwhile just for me to provide you a few uh, facts about our federation. The first Canadian Reformed Church was instituted in 1950, so we are a relatively young federation. The members of this first congregation, and certainly many others after it, were Dutch immigrants coming for the most part from the Reformed Church of the Netherlands, liberated. Since then, since 1950, we have grown to a total of some 57 congregations spread throughout most of Canada although in some concentrations, and in three locations in the United States of America. The membership at the end of 2016 stood at just over 19,000 members, of which 11,000 were communicant members. We have some, act of, sorry, some 60 active ministers, missionaries, and professors, and 18 retired ministers, missionaries, and professors reference to professors, the Federation does maintain its own institution for the training of the ministry called the Theological Seminary of the Canadian Reformed Churches located in Hamilton, Ontario. It is staffed by five full-time professors and currently has an enrollment of 16 students. Although not officially a function of the church, the members of most congregations maintain elementary and high school high schools for the training and education of their children. They consider this a very important aspect of their task. It's a high priority for them, in, despite the fact that it is a financial burden. In some places, the province does not contribute to this educational cost at all. In some provinces, it contributes some. The churches collectively have foreign mission activities in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Brazil, and in China. Organized home mission, and this certainly resonates with the discussion that we've had just before this, organized home mission is taking place in several locations, and increasingly we see individual churches and members within churches exploring and exercising their responsibilities to reach out to those around them. As a federation, we have formal relations, and I'll explain that in a moment, with several churches around the world. We call this having ecclesiastical fellowship. Like you, we are members of the International Conference of Reformed Churches, or the ICRC, and additionally of the North American Presbyterian Reformed Council, or NAPARC. By these means of membership in these organizations, we have opportunity to have contact with a number of additional federations apart from those with which we have formal relations. It's also through these venues that we have opportunity to interact with delegates of your federation uh, 
outside of general assemblies such as this and our own synods. We sincerely, sincerely thank you for the invitation you have extended for us to be present during this assembly and to you as members of the assembly and through you to all members of the Free Church, the Canadian Reformed Churches extend their greetings. I mentioned the ecclesiastical fellowship. We are thankful for that bond which we may have with you. This bond expresses the closeness of those who share the same faith in Jesus Christ as the only Savior. According to the agreements which we have, we may preach the gospel from one another's pulpits, partake in the sacraments, and keep in touch also concerning our relations with other church federations. But the most important aspect of this bond which we may have is that, you know, I quote from the agreement of the ecclesiastical fellowship which we have, and I quote, the churches shall assist each other in the maintenance, defense, and promotion of the Reformed faith in doctrine, church polity, discipline, and liturgy, and be watchful for deviations. You will note that this is essentially the same statement that you have in your documentation with respect to what governs ecclesiastical fellowship <clears throat> or ecumenical relations. While we are churches in different parts of the world, you here and we in, across the pond, so to speak, we're in the same world, a world that increasingly denies the existence of God and his anointed one, a world that lives in utter defiance of his will for his creation. We not only live in such a world, but find the world's influences increasingly encroaching on the churches as well. Certainly you have it here, and we also experience it in North America, that there is an unchristian and even anti-Christian spirit on the rise, a spirit which seeks to suppress the truth about God and deny the salvation which comes through Jesus Christ alone. The spirit of the age expresses itself in many different ways, also in the acceptance and normalization of sexual immorality and in various forms as well, in the, in the promotion of abortion and euthanasia on demand. All this misery and besides much more, it is the result of turning away from the true God and his goodwill as revealed in his holy word. As churches of Jesus Christ, we need to stand strong and together and be bright beacons in this dark world, proclaiming very clearly the grace and mercy of God in Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. We must also be watchful of our own flocks, that they would remain safe and secure in the love of their Heavenly Father. And as leaders of the churches, in the churches, we must be diligent in administering the gospel of God's grace to them so that they may be, to, may be able to withstand the pressure of the ungodly world around them. We also pray that we may, under God's blessing, be able to do more than that, but also witness of the work of Christ's spirit in our life and win others for Christ through our godly walk and talk. So it is imperative then that we stand united as churches of Jesus Christ and be of encouragement to one another as we work in God's kingdom, each in our own context and setting. It is good to also meet with one another as churches from different areas of the world so that we might help each other and be of assistance in the bond of gospel which we share. We hope that our visit to your General Assembly may also give us the opportunity to explore further, and we certainly heard that this morning in the discussion of the missions report, what it means to be in a relationship together. Uh, we have rules for that, you have rules for that, but to work that out, I think, is incumbent upon us, as you are doing with your uh, new strategic plan, and we hope that we can learn from that and maybe from time to time we can exchange ideas on that. Our last General Synod held in 2016 has also specifically given us the charge to continue the relationship of ecclesiastical fellowship under the agreement which we have, and we're most grateful to be able to carry this out also by being here. Brothers, moderator, we thank you for this opportunity to address you. May the Lord be with you in the continuation of your work as General Assembly, and may he bless you as churches to remain faithful to his word. Thank you very much. John, thank you.
John, I'd like to thank you. And Carl, you're very welcome. I'm glad you both uh, taken the time and effort to come and uh, be with us. Uh, we thank you for your words. Please bring uh, our greetings to your own denomination. Uh, and uh, we rich, pray you be richly blessed in your time with us. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have 45 minutes now um, when I hope that we can uh, move on to the next item. But I'm not sure if the person who's speaking is in the room. Oh, he's just coming now. Okay. So we we'll move back to uh, the uh, mission board <clears throat> report and uh, the section on youth. And can I ask for the assembly's permission to allow uh, Reverend Dr. Colin Dow to speak on behalf of that? Colin is a member of the board, but is not a member of assembly. Can we have your approval? Thank you. Dr. Dow. Moderator, fathers and brethren, thank you for the opportunity to address the General Assembly on behalf of the Youth Subcommittee of the Free Church Mission Board. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and following, we read these words. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. As a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed 15-year-old, I was brought to faith in Christ one September Sunday in 1987. The next Sunday, I was at a mission to military garrison gospel meeting at an RAF base in eastern Cyprus. Seated next to me that day was an impossibly old American man, even older than Dr. Ackroyd. <laughs> After the gospel service, he turned to me and he asked, and pardon my drawl, so, son, how long have you been a Christian? And uh, I looked at him and said, sir, I think about a week. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said to me, son, to my knowledge, I've been a follower of Jesus for 80 years. I've never forgotten his words. I'll never forget his words. This man's long life of loving faithfulness to Christ had a lasting impact upon me. I'm sure each one of us here can think of many old Christians, older Christians who have such a, had such a positive influence upon us. The point is there can be no greater gift we give to our children and young people than that as ministers and elders we live long lives of consistent, faithful, loving Christ-likeness, where as we get older in body, we get younger in heart, and our zeal for Jesus and for his gospel and for his mission grows. Let me challenge each one of us here, myself more than anyone else, to have the enthusiasm of that old saint who took interest in a 15-year-old fair-haired boy that day in RAF Ias Nicolaios. Likewise, there can be no greater curse we can impose upon our children than failing to follow Jesus with joy, seriousness, and faithfulness. Our lifestyle and character is a greater witness than any youth committee program. The Youth Committee remains eager to assist and empower the church to shepherd its children's hearts and in so doing to embrace God's challenge in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 following. Let me just take a few moments to fix our priorities. Last year the General Assembly gave us the remit of investigating the issue of Christian schooling and education. Having completed an extensive literature survey, the committee realised just how huge a task this was and so having co-opted an expert, the Reverend Joe Barnard, onto our group, we'll be holding focused discussion groups later on in June. These discussion groups will enjoy the participation of various informed, invited and interested stakeholders. We're excited about the remit the Assembly has placed on our shoulders 
but recognise that it will take some time for such a programme to happen. So we beg your indulgence as we continue the remit. As, every, as with every year, the majority of the youth committee's time has been taken up by our extensive portfolio of youth camps. We commend to the prayers of the church, Mrs. Laura McCauley, the camp's administrator, who every year, surrounded by 100,000 different issues, facilitates the smooth running of our impressive portfolio of camps. We want to pay tribute to our outgoing camps supervisor, the Reverend Colin Morrison Elgin. He stepped in at a time of great need and with Colin's characteristic calmness and efficiency has inspired us all. Let me also introduce to the General Assembly, uh, to, let me introduce to you our new camp supervisor. The Reverend Dan Patterson is uniquely gifted in the area of youth ministry, passionate and one who most certainly practice what he preaches. We were delighted that Dan accepted the position of being our new camp supervisor. We cannot have hoped for a better fit, and we commend Dan to the prayers of the church and ask that if you have an opportunity as individuals, you go and have a word with him and you encourage him in that task. Let me also pay tribute to the leaders and the cooks who give of their own time to make our camp's program such a spiritual success. As you can see from the assembly report, over 300 children attended last year's youth camps. The leaders' reports contained stories of our young people committing themselves to Christ for the first time and growing in their discipleship in Jesus. Many of us here on the very floor of this assembly can trace the beginnings of our spiritual interest to free church youth camps. Who knows, but among the hundreds of our young people going to free church youth camp every year, there may be tomorrow's ministers and elders. We were confronted this year with the problem of having to cancel the North Uist Extreme Sports Camp. This was due to circumstances beyond our control. However, we believe in a God who is in control, and so we're looking to him for next year. We've even got a Shinty camp this year, and we pray that God would bless uh, Andy Murray and Sean Ankers uh, in the Kamenach camp. We could go through each camp and we could bring your hearts real joy with stories of spiritual encouragement and challenges overcome. In the next year, we hope to be formulating a plan for a camp's ambassador stroke camp's ambassadors who will travel round congregations raising the profile of the Free Church Camps programme among congregations. When it comes to Sunday school, the Youth Committee wants to encourage ministers and Kirk Sessions to take a lively, prayerful interest in our children. We commend and thank all our Sunday school teachers, but challenge our ministers and Kirk Sessions to know what is being taught and offer whatever support they can to their Sunday schools. But ultimately, we know that the greatest influence upon our children comes from their parents and from their home environments. That's why we're delighted to inform the General Assembly that the Reverend Joe Barnard Coltarity has written a book called Pleasing God as a Family, Helping and Developing the Practice of Family, Piety and Love. We had hoped to have this book published and printed, ready for you to take away a copy with you um, at this assembly. However, the clock's beaten us. I, I can't speak highly enough of Joe's work, and I want to place on record our thanks to him for his tireless beating of this most important drum. The minute this book is published and printed, let me encourage you, go out, buy a copy, and then buy copies for others as well. It will help each one of us talk about Christ in our home when we're walking by the way, when we're going to sleep, and when we're rising. There's many aspects of our work that I don't have time to inspire you with this afternoon. The consistently overbooked and wonderfully run youth conference. The annually marvellous Big Free Rally. Did you know that this year was its 20th anniversary? And we thank God for that. The strategic value of a leadership boot camp. So many other things as well. Let me pay tribute to my fellow members of the youth committee, Sarah Johnson, Karina McKeever, David Kirk, and John Morrison. Thank you for your patience and all your hard work. 
God commands all of us to live a life of faithfulness and love. The greatest gift we can give to our children is to love Jesus. Moderator, fathers and brethren, I commend to you the report of the Youth Committee. Does anyone have any questions of Dr. Dow regarding the, anything in the report or what he said? No? Then can we... Yeah. So, to move this report. Thank you. And is that seconded? Seconded. Thank you. Now, we take amendments at this point. Yeah. Evan? Addendum. Addendum. Sorry. Yes, Evan. This is on the blue, light blue sheet. Moderator, thank you for this opportunity and thank you, Dr. Dow, for an excellent presentation of the youth report. And uh, my addendum, I hope, will be accepted because it's not controversial. Uh, Second point of the addendum, um, and again, I don't want this to be at all controversial, um, with the abolition of uh, the award system uh, agreed at last year's assembly, at a stroke, several things were discontinued. The Lylor Prizes, the Explorations Projects, an official scheme of memory work and, and uh, catechism, and an annual recognition of the work and worth of hundreds of our children through the records of achievement. Now, unfortunately, to my mind, by abolishing all these things at a stroke, that created a vacuum. And it's that vacuum which I know that the committee uh, is hoping to fill, but it's a pity that it hadn't been filled before all these things had been abolished. Now, I know that the committee has uh, encouraged that we acknowledge and celebrate achievement within our own congregations, <coughs> believing, and I quote, that this would have more of an impact on the children than certificates and awards from the central church. Well, of course, there's no reason why congregations cannot acknowledge and celebrate achievement within their own congregations, of course. They can, and I'm sure many of them do. But I was a bit concerned that the Youth Committee was abrogating its responsibility here and handing everything over to local congregations uh, and almost encouraging a congregationalism, uh, which I don't think we would uh, recommend. Now, I am not rec requesting a recall for the Lylor Prizes. I'm not requesting a recall for the explorations projects because they had got embedded difficulties within them. But I am calling for a recognition of the importance of memory work, of scripture, and of catechism. And uh, I'm sure that the committee will have no problem about uh, agreeing with that. But it seems to me, too, that in our Sunday schools, we have got hundreds of children who are all part of perhaps small or greater Sunday schools. But I do feel there is a, a benefit in giving these children 
a recognition that they are part of a bigger whole. They are part of the Free Church of Scotland. And one of the things that the Records of Achievement did was to recognize the fact, yeah, that they had worked away and that they were part of this big church. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm not calling for a return to a competitive uh, program whereby some children will receive uh, an award and others won't. What I am calling for is recognition for all our children to be given by the Youth Committee to say, yes, you are part of this denomination and we are proud to have you as part of our Sunday schools. And so uh, I would ask uh, the Youth Committee and the Board to accept this uh, addendum uh, in talking with it, uh, with uh, Dr. Dow and with uh, um, Mr. McLeod, there seemed to suggest that the, there was in the addendum an idea that there was a competitive element that I was trying to encourage within the church. That is not the case. And you will notice that there is no wording really to that uh, in, the, in the addendum. But if, if they feel that it would be better uh, if I included something in the wording to uh, uh, put their mind at rest with this regard, then I would be very happy, for example, if it were possible to do so, uh, to, to reword this uh, addendum simply by adding uh, one uh, hyphenated phrase. The Youth Committee will provide an annual program of optional memory work in scripture and catechism and inaugurate an annual non-competitive scheme to recognise the identity of each of our Sunday school children within the Free Church of Scotland. I would move in these terms. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Have, has anyone any questions uh, with regard to this addendum? Mr. Watson, Ian. that the Youth Committee would be able to interpret that in a very positive way, in that it is simply to uh, let them realize that in their little Sunday school, they are part of a bigger whole, and that it might involve, for example, but it would up to be up to the Youth Committee to decide how best to do it. It might involve, for example, uh, some sort of... Uh, a uh, certificate uh, which is distributed to all the Sunday school teachers and that at the end of their session, when they will have a prize giving of some kind or an award, whatever it is they do, that they will have this handed out to them on behalf of the Youth Committee of the Free Church to say, look, you are part of this big organization. You do need to reward. Pardon? It's to, it's to recognize their existence and their presence in, in, uh, as members of a Sunday school. I'm not complaining, but what I'm, I really just want clarity. I think what you mean is to reward. And therefore, I think you should say that. To recognize the identity of. Am I the only one that finds that a confusing phrase? Well, uh, that's, that's how I felt that it could be worded so that each member, each, each Sunday school pupil could be recognized as participating in a Sunday school program and at the end of their session, there you are, that's you. Uh, the Free Church is, is uh, acknowledging this, not necessarily rewarding them in that sense. Well then, how about saying uh, inaugurate an annual non-competitive scheme to, what did you just say, acknowledge?
just about to say that. <laughs> well, I don't know what the phrase means. The uh, youth uh, subcommittee will take on board your non-understanding and try and accommodate it in such a way that keeps everybody happy. Any other questions? Then you have moved in terms of the, the wording with the addition of the phrase an annual non-competitive scheme. Do we have a seconder? I haven't asked for a seconder, so... Seconded. Thank you. No. Thank you. Sure. Would anyone uh, at this point like to speak to the report or the amendment? Mr. Patterson, Dan. The new camp's supervisor. You're following in great footsteps. Yeah. I was doing it for a number of years. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, this will be hopefully the last time I speak. Um, I am simply speaking today on behalf of the small team who organise the Big Three rally every year. There are 280 young people from all across Scotland attend the Big Three rally. That's an astonishing amount of young people. It's a great day for them. We have buses coming from every direction, gathering together. It is organised by a small team who never really receive the thanks that they are due. They don't look for the thanks either. They know who they are and they do a tremendous job. You can imagine trying to coordinate that costs money. If you would like to thank them, can I ask the presbyteries to put their hands in their pockets? Because last year we had to run the Big Free Rally on the donations of two presbyteries. We asked for £100 from each presbytery. Now God in his wisdom, he caused the two presbyteries that I gave to give double the amount of money. But can you imagine trying to run such an event on such a shoestring? So we asked the presbyteries to finance it. We asked them to give. When you go back to your presbyteries, please remember that work does require money. And I just want to leave that with you and ask that you remember that and perhaps prompt your presbyteries to support that work. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Very tempting to ask you to name and shame, but maybe that would be inappropriate. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Fraser, James. <coughs> Fathers and brethren, and I'm sorry popping up again so soon. Um, I just wanted to refer to paragraph 9, I think it is, in the report, which talks about the conference and education at maybe 8, um, that the Youth Committee is proposing to organise. And first of all, to welcome this. This is really good. And to urge the committee to approach this from a very wide angle. A lot of discussions around Christian education have foundered around the controversy between uh, people who want to educate their children at home and people who don't want Christian children withdrawn from schools. Now, I have total respect for both these camps. Uh, there are some places in Scotland where even if Christians wanted to withdraw their children from school um, and educate them themselves, they can't really do it. And there are some places in Scotland where it's unlikely that there'll be Christian schools unless they're digital schools. And I think it would be really, really good if we started from the position that there are merits in both of these camps and get away from uh, really emotive arguments where one camp is trying to uh, take an imperialistic attitude to another. That's my first point. Um, because I think we'll end up with a diversity anyway. My second point is that I think there are imaginative ways now, and technology has helped us greatly, 
of beginning to marry the school concept and the parental education concept, because you imagine that uh, in certain areas, you, all the parents could come together, bring their children, and have a school-like experience put into it, and it does happen in certain areas. My final point is, however, that I don't think we're ambitious enough. I think we are losing the minds of our children when they go to secondary school. They go to secondary school not well enough equipped to deal with the onslaught they're going to get there. Now, this is not me arguing for, uh, for withdrawing children from secondary education. That's a different argument. Um, I'm arguing for ensuring that our children are equipped with a Christian worldview as well as with the Christian story before they go to secondary school. Now, I think we take it for granted very often that they will go to secondary school with a Christian story. Um, I think we've got to be sure that they are going to school with a Christian story. And I don't think we should be dependent on Sunday schools to do that. They don't have enough time to do that. And that's why I think it's absolutely great that um, we've heard that commendation in the book on, on parenting. But I think we could do more. Muslims will take children to mosques to educate them during the week for an hour or two. Instead of running frenetically around making sure that children do ballet, do horse riding, do music, do everything that their parents would love to have done, let's give an hour or two hours to the church during the week. And let's use that time to communicate in an exciting and not a boring way the Christian worldview. So that before they reach secondary education, they've heard of the arguments around devolution. And when the, they go to secondary schools and people tell them they're stupid if they believe in creation, that's not the first time they've encountered that kind of, of experience. And also, people can help children, even young children, to take a critical view of the films and the books and all the things that are around them. The old system was, don't allow them read, don't allow them watch it. The better system is to give them the critical apparatus so that when they see unchristian presumptions underlying what they're experiencing, whether it's in pop songs, whether it's in, in books, whether it's in films, and you know how out of date I am by my language, um, whatever it is, whether it's the stuff they're encountering digitally, we're beginning to equip them. And we say to ourselves, it's not enough to have them for an hour a week or two hours a week at Sunday school. We need to be more ambitious and we need to be more challenging. And we need to say to parents, if you want your children to be equipped uh, to survive in this world, and if we want that generation to be the Christians who carry this work on, we've got to equip them with a Christian worldview before they go to secondary school. And that can be done by bigger churches and hub areas. It can even be done digitally by smaller churches who can't command the personnel to do it face to face. And, I've, I've banged this drum, I'm sorry, unsuccessfully. I've been hopelessly unpersuasive uh, over the last two years about this. So I'm having another go, and I'll keep going. Um, and I hope the Youth Committee will take some of that on board at their education conference. Thank you. Moderator, fathers and brethren, I have much sympathy with the addendum from uh, Evan MacDonald. And I do want to wish, I, I do wish to raise something here which did concern me at a time when the statistical survey came out recently. I was uh, quite disturbed by some of the definitions, and one definition in particular um, was uh, particularly uh, unhappy. Baptized children are not members until they have been formally added to the membership role. That moderator, as far as I can see, is at odds with our confessional position. Children are members of the visible church by baptism. And even if they are not communicants, they are not disqualified from being in membership of the visible church. That's what our standards say. 
and therefore they are members of congregations once they are baptized. They are not communicant members, and I think it's an unhappy reference that uh, the reference to the role is membership role rather than communion role. The membership role of our congregations ought, if we have a complete role, to include baptized children. The communion role contains those who take communion, who are communicant members. In the words of old Samuel Rutherford, moderator, our position is, communicants are drawn from the membership of the church. And in relation to that, that's why I'm saying that this addendum is welcome. It recognizes the true membership and identity of our children in the church from the time of their baptism, if not before. And I think our pastoral uh, responsibilities toward them is much enhanced by regarding them as members of the visible church, in line with our own confessional position as a Presbyterian church, rather than uh, a definition that would suggest in a more Baptist, uh, Baptist type uh, approach that membership begins at the point of taking communion. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to the report or the amendment? Mr. McMillan. Uh, quickly, just to say thank you to Sarah McLeod for boot camp, uh, or Sarah Johnson as she's uh, ought to be referred to now. Sorry, Sarah. Uh, so boot camp is referred to in the youth report. Uh, it's a great week. We run it once a year. We have about 40 young adults who come. They get a really intensive week of theological teaching and outdoor exercise, training, physical challenge. Uh, Sarah's the person who really pulls all of that together, and it's a huge amount of work. So thank you, Sarah. Every year we write to all the congregations in the denomination asking you to recommend potentially good young leaders uh, that we can invite to boot camp. So I'm just asking you to be our kind of talent spotters. Uh, look out for the young leaders between 17 and 25, usually is the age group we're looking for, who you think have great potential uh, to be outstanding Christian leaders in the future. We're especially keen to use it as a way of recruiting church planters. So every year you should get a letter from Sarah asking you to recommend people for boot camp. Please take the time just to pray that over, think it out, who could you maybe send? Uh, and if you send them to us, uh, I think you'll find that it's a really great and rewarding experience for them. So thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks for boot camp. Thanks, moderator. Neil. <clears throat> Mr. Gray, Ian. Moderator, uh, fathers and uh, brothers, as perhaps one of the youngest commissioners, I thought it would be appropriate that uh, the report I stand up to speak to uh, about first would be the youth report. I'm new to the Assembly, I'm uh, new to the Board of Trustees, I'm relatively new to the, the Office of, of Eldership as well, uh, but what I'm not new to is the youth programme uh, that the Free Church runs, and you have them all listed there, and I have been uh, blessed as being able to participate in, I think, all of them as they are on the sheet in front of you, and I want to uh, commend to you, uh, brothers, that uh, what has been done throughout many of these programmes uh, and how the Lord blesses the work that is done uh, in these programmes. As you read uh, the sections there, um, our last uh, spokesman, Mr McMillan, spoke about the boot camp, and yes, I, I did survive boot camp, and I know what you're thinking when you heard about rigorous exercise, uh, <laughs> that how is this possible that I'm standing here, but um, although that may be challenging and early in the morning, uh, what's even more challenging has been in the same room as Neil McMillan, Derek Lamont and David Robertson, uh, but managed to survive that. And I am thankful for that. I'm thankful for their teaching, 
for uh, their uh, dedication throughout the week, the giving of their time to come away for it. And I would commend more uh, ministers and elders and those who are in positions of leadership in the church who have the wisdom uh, to impart to us uh, younger uh, generation, the next generation of the leaders of the church, God willing. And uh, what I would like to highlight in response to all these items that go ahead is that they cannot go ahead without the older people in the church. And I have benefited greatly from the, the wisdom and the advice and the guidance, uh, the teaching, uh, whether it's from my parents uh, or whether it's from those who are parents in the congregation or grandparents and those who are uh, older, wiser Christians who are imparting their knowledge. So I would commend uh, all the activities that the youth uh, committee are involved in and promoting here. And I would also commend and express my grateful uh, thanks to the older people in the congregation and the denomination as a whole uh, for all that they contribute in their time and their talents and their energy, all to the glory of God. Thank you. Any further speakers? Mr. Coke. Robert Coke from the Gaelock area. Can I just say that I've been a chaplain um, in a Christian school, secondary school, and I was also a chaplain in a school that had some sort of Christian ethos to it. Also, in another incarnation uh, in the Church of England, I've had the um, ability to be the chairman of um, school, um, Christian school, primary schools, and had them in my parish as a minister in the Church of England. Can I just say that one of the things that really struck me about these schools is there are so few Christian teachers. This is a problem. These schools are set up with great ideals as to how we can use um, Christian education to help our young people to know the Christian story. But if you haven't got Christian teachers coming through uh, to become heads, uh, to teach RE, uh, to just bring the Christian presence into the teaching body, you really find that your hands often are tied. So I can, can I just ask that as we look at uh, Christian education, the committee could just think about that. Is there any way in which we can really encourage our youngsters when they get to a professional level and they're going to university to think about whether they could become teachers and in particular perhaps teachers of religious education? Now, just in a moment, I'm going to ask Mr. Dow to respond uh, to these um, comments. But can I just say at this point that I've been advised by uh, the clerks that uh, there's been a slight change to the amendment, which has been uh, agreed by the proposer and by, uh, the, uh, by Dr. Dow, so that we have um, the General Assembly welcomes the Youth Committee's proposal, proposed programme to train, equip and support Sunday school teachers. The Youth Committee will provide an annual programme of optional memory work in scripture and catechism and inaugurate an annual non-competitive scheme to acknowledge each of our Sunday school children within the Free Church of Scotland. And Mr. Watson, I hope, will be able to understand that uh, better. Mr. Dow. Moderator, thank you very much and thank you to you all for uh, stimulating questions and comments. Can I crave your forgiveness, please, uh, for presuming upon uh, the fact that Dan Patterson only becomes the camp supervisor with assembly approval, not, not by our approval. So if this deliverance carries, Dan becomes the camp supervisor. Thank you very much for your comments, Dan, on funding. Uh, challenging indeed. And thank you also, James, for banging the drum about Christian education. You may even convince me one day. Um, James, thank you very much for your comments about covenant theology. We often uh, divorce our practice from our principles, and it's refreshing to hear from our senior clerk our principles being uh, enforced in our practice. Uh, Neil Bootcamp, what can we say about Neil and Bootcamp? Um, Ian, thank you so much for your comments, and congratulations on your engagement to Marion McCauley. 
uh, you have a very good deal with Marion. Uh, Robert, thank you again for your input in Christian education. And uh, we would want to echo your, your, your comments. Young people, you should be thinking about a career in teaching and teaching RE or teaching in Christian schools. Um, with that, we're happy to accept uh, Evan's amendment, uh, addendum rather, and thank you very much for, for your, your patience. Thank you. In which case, uh, the deliverance is accepted. Thank you. I'll just hand over to the clerks for uh, some intimations and uh, other information. Um, paragraphs E1 and E2 to be deleted and replaced with 1. The General Assembly instructs the Deacon's Court of London City Presbyterian Church and the Board of Trustees to continue their consultation in the terms required by the 2016 General Assembly, being consultation concerning the loan from the Board of Trustees to the Congregation of Cobham Presbyterian Church, payment of ministry stipendiary expenses for the year 2015 until the pastoral tie of Reverend David D. Miller was severed with the congregation any other loans made for the purchase of the manse. The General no Assembly notes the proposal of the Kirk Session of London City Presbyterian Church endorsed by the Deacon's Court of the Congregation to make a free will gift to the church in recognition of the gift the centrally contributed uh, towards the purchase of the Cobham manse. To the extent that the Deacon's Court deems this responsible in view of its duties and financial obligations in London. Three, the General Assembly declares that grant monies paid to Cobham Presbyterian Church and interest payment waived by the Free Church during Cobham's status as an extension charge were historic gifts by the denomination and are not to be returned. Four, the General Assembly A notes the challenges faced by the London City Congregation surrounding and following the union with Cobham. B assures the congregation of its goodwill, fraternal support and prayers. C. Notes the huge need for reformed gospel ministry across London. And D. Encourages the Kirk Session and Deacon's Court of the Congregation to optimize their use of available resources for the furtherance of gospel ministry in that great city. Uh, that will be issued when we come back this evening so that you can have it overnight for your bedtime reading. I've got one intimation here which I've been handed and agreed to read out. It's from Mr. Ian MacDonald. Um, the Keswick Convention House Party, 21st to 28th July. Bible readings by Reverend Alistair Begg. Spaces are still available, so please contact Ian and Mary MacDonald of the Trotternish Congregation, Isle of Skye. Ian, can you show your hand, please? So we, if you want to ask about it, please uh, see Ian for details. Moderator, at this stage, in view of um, what's coming up this evening in the petition from the Western Isles Presbytery, um, I would request that the Assembly allow the presence of Mr. Scott Matheson and also uh, uh, Principal Ivor Martin, along with commissioners for that private session. Uh, both of these gentlemen have been uh, directly involved, particularly in the formulation and issuing of statements during the course of this business. Um, ordinarily, it's uh, only, by ex only the commissioners that are allowed to be present at a meeting in camera. Uh, but on occasions, we have made exceptions. There is a pre plenty precedent for it. So um, it's in the hands of the assembly, but I'm recommending that these two gentlemen, given um, their detailed in, um, involvement previously, would be allowed to be present. Is that agreed in the assembly? The General Assembly now adjourn to meet again in this hall at 6.30 this evening, of which public intimation is hereby given. I we'll stand for the benediction. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortality, who dwells in an approachable light, whom no one has ever seen nor can see.
To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen.